and we are live. I don't have the LinkedIn stream up yet, so hopefully everyone there is happy. Uh, this is uh, John Reed. I'm joined by Brian Summer, my podcast partner in crime from the old school. I got to say, we looked better on podcasts than we do here on video, but anyway, okay. Yeah, what are we going to do? This is my official uh, reboot of my podcast series on in the video format. We are streaming live to five destinations today. Wherever you see it, you can participate. Um, this is a little bit different than most enterprise video shows. I know you're probably, you guys are probably thinking, oh man, I don't want to watch another friggin' video show online. Well, anyway, this is the only one that doesn't have a business model. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't have a sponsor. No one's allowed to use the word pivot or call each other a thought leader. And you don't have to listen to Brian and I drone on and on. There's audience participation today. But we're, what we're going to do is we're going to talk. I'm calling this Enterprise Hits and Misses Radio, by the way. Uh, and it's kind of based a little bit on my Diginomica Enterprise Hits and Misses column. Uh, but basically, we're going to talk about why Brian hates e ERP so much these days. <laughs> uh, what actually does inspire him, what CIOs need to be thinking about during pandemic times and stuff like that. Uh, so feel free to sound off uh, if you're listening at the moment. If you miss anything, you will be able to catch a replay. Uh, no matter where you're watching is fine, um, but if you can get over to LinkedIn, that's probably the most fun place to watch it, uh, but it's really up, up to you. So um, anyhow, uh, let's kind of get into things. Uh, oh, we have Natalie Sutton. Hey, Natalie. Good to see you. Natalie from IFS, who has to put up with us on many occasions. I think we may be in trouble, John, because we've probably rankled so many uh, AR people at different uh, ERP firms that we're going to have, we'll, we'll be flooded with comments from folks, you know, about like, really, really? Yeah. Okay. So. Nat Natalie, you're just in time to hear how much Brian hates ERP. So this is, <laughs> this should be great. Uh, but, uh, but okay. So let, let's kind of step into this a little bit because Brian, you, you vented spleen on a couple of Diginomica columns in the last few weeks and uh, readers can check those out at your leisure, but just, just to kind of give you a sense of them, uh, one of them was called uh, Don't Be a Sheep, Challenge a Call to Replatform ERP. And then you followed that up. That wasn't enough. You followed it up with a Friday rant last week. ERP in 2020 is is a mess. Um, yeah. did, did an ERP vendor, like, date your daughter or, like, toilet paper your lawn? Or well, what, what happened here? No, but you're now making me think uh, what's going to happen to my house here on Halloween. Uh, you know, so there'll be some ERP trick or treaters coming by to bring me the gifts of payback. But uh, no, I'll tell you what, uh, you know, folks like you and I, we do tons of these briefings with vendors. And uh, lately we've just wrapped it. We're wrapping up the fall busy season. And uh, that one rant about it's a mess. It's just like every one of these vendors was saying the same thing, you know, Hey, look at my shiny new platform. Hey, you know, look at, uh, look at the fact that I've got some new widgets that can do AI and machine learning or some advanced smarter analytics. And, you know, it's like, I've heard that from everybody. You know, what I'm really looking for is show me real application that you built, uh, you know, on these new technologies. Show me something other than new plumbing. It's like me getting excited about, well, if somebody invited you over to their house and go, hey, we've redone the house, you won't believe it. We put all new copper piping in the walls. But if everything looks the same, what's there to get excited about? So I wasn't too excited about what I saw. Yeah, I think it's interesting because uh... – <laughs> Oh, we got a LinkedIn LinkedIn user who is uh, on top of your game. Says, uh, "I've never followed Brian, but I will now." ERP is in a complete <laughs> mess, in my humble opinion. So you're preaching to the choir today, Brian. Wow! Thank Preach God, I got me. one fan uh, out there. So thank you, whoever you are, uh, LinkedIn user. That was nice to see. Um, yeah, it is kind of a mess, and it's a mess. On you know, the economics are upside down. You know, we've got projects that are this big and they deliver that much whoops uh, that much value and there's better stuff to chase in some cases anyway I'm, I'm not trying to bash the vendors I think it's just a question of where are the priorities and this is a time also where 
there's other issues uh, at play, and one has to do with just how empathetic is the ERP vendor? Uh, you know, are they paying more attention to what Wall Street thinks about them versus what customers need and want from them in these times? And a good example of that is uh, we know that we hear a lot of vendors use words like agile, resiliency, um, flexibility, scalability. We hear all those kind of words. Uh, but I really dare you to go find those in their contracts. Uh, we saw a lot of contracts that only scale one direction up. And, uh, you know, when I hear vendors describe how, you know, the, oh, they're, they're going to, you know, that the cloud has made, excuse me, the, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has made companies desire more of these scalable solutions. That the way they interpret that is, oh, well, then we just need to put it up on a hyperscaler and that makes it scalable. Well, you know, scale and covers a lot of things. And one is I got to be able to size up and size down the solution, the footprint, the computing resources it chews up, do by contract scale accordingly as well. Okay. We have uh, one complaint about the sound quality. Uh, LinkedIn user, I'm sorry you're having sound issues. I don't know if it's universal at the moment. Uh, what I can tell you is, as far as the Echo, uh, we did all the sound tests and we're both wearing headsets. Uh, that's about all we can do for the Echo thing. Um, if we get more complaints, we might have to uh, reboot the broadcast. But in the meantime, one thing, oh, okay, you said you reconnected and it's okay. Okay, cool. All right, good. good. All right. So, uh, sound check. We passed the sound check. This is this is good news. <clears throat> uh, yeah, no, I hear you, Brian. I mean, I think one of the one of the really oh, thanks, Gabriel. Glad it sounds okay to you. I, I was going to be really bummed if uh, if if I screwed up the sound on the on my second reboot video, but but anyway, Brian, I think one of the one of the things I'm really struck by with 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 the ERP, ERP right now is that is that there's really this problem where, so we, we published a piece by Remini Street a while back and they, they provide uh, maintenance and support for ERP customers. And one of the things that they described is this notion of ring fencing your ERP. Um, and, and what that's all about is, is the fact that the innovation is perceived to be going on elsewhere. And, and, so, and so I think I think for ERP vendors, the interesting challenge is like, don't just move stuff to the cloud because a lift and shift to the cloud is not giving customers anything more than, than, than just remote work help. I mean, I think what happened is in the beginning of the pandemic, people were so eager to make cloud moves just because they needed access to these friggin' systems. Uh, but, but that's not enough. You can't stop there. By the way, just real quick. Hi, Sheldon. Great to see you. It's been a long time. I was just thinking about you the other day. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Brian, back to you. So you're right. Um, there's many things that go in the value prop, and um, the ring fencing argument works the best when you think about what am I getting? You know, where is the value? And I know there's a lot of white space out there of things that have not been solved yet, and most of it involves um, some of the new enabling technologies, whether that's uh, machine learning, AI, chatbot technology, and we can go down a list of things. But there's also the stuff you need to uh, completely wire up uh, the entire digital factory of the future, you know, and having a digital fingerprint that goes through the entirety of the supply chain all the way through the other end of the value chain uh, at the end of the final co consumer. There's so many gigantic gaps in information. And if you want to talk about the first place people want to do some digital transformations, they, they seem to want to plug the holes in there first before they can actually do some transformational activity. But, uh, you know, there's opportunity out there all over the place. And what we really need to see are vendors and integrators and implementers who aren't going to just say, well, we've got some tools and we'll do a custom configuration, custom development kind of project with you. It's actually building packages or applications or can vertical solutions that bring all that together. That's like to me, those are the entry stakes we need to have and see right off the bat. And that's where I think some of the cool initial frontier apps, whether it's in process automation or robotic process automation, uh, it's in all it's in defining all the workflows and it's it's, if you will, in making the 
velocity and the integrity of information just fly through an enterprise. But that's an inwardly looking view. And this is where I think the ring fencing idea really kind of uh, makes you think because there's a lot of other data out there, dark data, big data, uh, data in, uh, co in contracted databases that you buy or lease, uh, in uh, social sentiment information and machine uh, data. And that's the stuff that needs to be brought into the fold. Because if you really want your company to be at the top of the heap in its industry, then you've got to have solutions that do that. And that's really where the value is. It's not in finding an eighth way to allocate a balance in the general ledger. Right. And I think one of the things we struggle with a lot is just you know, these are pandemic times, right? And, you know, there seems to be such a push on, like, let's try to get back to our old model as soon as possible, right? So uh, we hear that a lot from from vendors, like, see you in Vegas in February. And it's like, uh, yeah, have fun with that. I, I, enjoy the strip. Uh, you know, uh, br bring your uh, N95 mask and have fun. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I think part of it is just that, Right now, we need a different message, and we need something that's more about customer empathy. It's more about helping people. It's not a innovation and technology message at, the, at its core, right? And so, so I guess I wanted to just ask you about reopening. I mean, this is this whole thing. What what is your take on reopening? How should we talk about that? I think there are a number of interesting enough. There's a number of applications that have yet to be built or being built right now that companies are going to want need before they can really fully reopen. And there are obvious ones, you know, related around safety, about monitoring uh, people, and and there are legal issues that go around these as well. Can you actually capture and record somebody's temperature and keep it in a database over time? Uh, there's a million of these kind of points, and they vary around the world. Um, there's other things where we're going to need to tap into data, into travel management systems and tie those in to find out, can somebody come in and, oops, by the way, if somebody all of a sudden does test positive, do we know who else they interacted with at work? It's like we have to go back to building that heat map software to know who you physically interacted with so that we can also have them quarantined. I, you know, there's there's a lot of work. I mean, there really is a lot of work. Let's not underestimate that. I think the first reaction was to take the work out of the office and have people work from home. But if you do want to bring them in, and you will want to in time, uh, at least for periods of time, the question is how do you do that? Do it safely and do it without getting sued or exposing workers to undue harm. Again, lots of work in front. Yeah, it's created some interesting challenges for folks like you and me, right? Because, uh, you know, I, I have been, I've written this pretty blistering series on virtual events because basically these virtual events that enterprise vendors have put on this year have been, have been terrible. Um, and, and uh, you know, you know, basically what they did is they took, they took the worst stuff from their on the ground events and, and put it online. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah it's, uh, I, I heard one yesterday and it started off, you know, well, John, thank you very much for inviting me here on your show today. And I'm like, oh, my God, uh, you know, I'm going to be out of this so fast. I hate infomercials. I won't watch them at home. I won't watch them on an airplane on the in-flight video. And I don't really want to watch them at my office desk either. And you're right. It's a challenge. And for doing analyst work like we do, uh, I think the best part of the events actually is rubbing shoulders with the customers. I, I know you've seen me do this. I, I love to grab another analyst at, at some show and we'll just go show up at the customer lunch or breakfast and just grill them on a million questions. Man, you oh, yeah. find that you find out incredible amounts of information from that. And you're the pro when it comes to sitting down with somebody for like 45 minutes to an hour and find out every little nuance of how they implemented or didn't implement a particular package. And you, we're not getting that right now. That That's like a whole channel, of, a couple of channels of information that are just gone. I want to get back to that in a sec because I want to get into a little bit about how how you and I are, are covering the market. But before that, I do want to cover this user's comment because it ties back to um, what we just discussed. And it, the comment's so huge that you can't see our pictures, so I won't leave it on the screen for very long. Um, but um, 
Companies generally implement ERP, then ring, ring, ring fest to try and control costs, often led by consultancies and lose the ability to truly innovate. The BI team who sit across could offer real advice and improvements, but often are just used to firefight the process issues rather than address them. Yeah, I think the this goes back to the complexity of so many of these ERP systems. They are infinitely flexible before you implement them. They can do everything. But once they once you implement them, it's like that old line, they're as flexible as like somebody pouring concrete in a jello mold, and you're never going to change them after that. Um, I see another comment popped up here. Uh, this, I'm going to let you get this one, John, about SAP technologies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well Leo, Leo, what's up? Good to see you, man. Uh, uh, yeah, he's saying that he had a good show, Mastering SAP Technologies. I mean, first of all, the eventful guys are, are, are some of the best best guys in the business as far as putting on on the ground events. So I'm not really surprised that their virtual event is pretty good. I I wasn't um, technically invited, Leo. I don't know why I didn't get that invite. I guess I'm not 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 suitable for for prime time with them at the moment. But uh, but I'm sure it was pretty good because what they what they typically do before they're on the ground events is they have customer um, advisories that that have input on what they're going to do, and they're pretty creative in their formats. So I'm not surprised. Um, but in, in general, I've been hammering these 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 events, and the reason I've been hammering them so much is because. There's such a loss of creativity in these event formats, and I have been to some events that were quite good, but just only a handful. Um, but but the thing is that the technology with virtual, everyone is is using the excuse that it's not the same as being on the ground. But in fact, there's quite a lot you can accomplish. I went to one really good event for Zoom and video professionals that had it had a specialized track. It was a paid pro track that I I got into, and um, it was really neat because speakers would roll off the main stage. And they would join this group of people on the pro track and they would just start having informal talks around how did your keynote go, you know, what, and people would pepper them with questions. Then someone else would roll off the stage. And then suddenly there was like this group conversation and people, different keynote speakers with totally different backgrounds, like arguing with each other. And like, it, it was really creative and, you know, it, it had that feeling of live immediacy, which is like what these events have really not had. Like, like pretty much with all these events, you kind of say to yourself, well, I'll get registered and I'll just check out a few recordings at my leisure over the weekend. <laughs> uh, but uh, but anyway, I mean, I think that's that's the real issue right now is that we just cannot seem to be able to get these vendors to to take risks on these events. Uh, Brian, I think you might be uh, muted at the moment. I'm not sure why. Why don't you toy around with your sound for a minute? Um, I'm back. I'm back. Oh, Sorry. there we go. All right. <laughs> so anyway. I, I was going to say the uh, the best events are ones that are entertaining and educational. And if it's really canned and formulaic, it's not going to be very entertaining. Um, you know, I, I, I think people listen, learn, and uh, enjoy things. Uh, and when that all that happens, you got you got you got gold. And when you make it boring or dull or pre-recorded to the point of being just dry as a desert, you're not really going to get your messages heard or picked up. Anyway, and yes, Leo, I, 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 I'm sure everybody figured out that was the correct name, not what showed up on the screen. So I was going to bring that up, but okay. Uh, hey, man, you know you, Leo's not going to miss stuff like that. He's 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 on the ball. But, you know, it, it is funny because as, as much of a advocate I am for pushing the creative envelope on these events, um, you know, the, the thing is, I have admitted one thing, though, Brian, which is, say, the one thing I can't get um, is I can't talk to drunk customers. <laughs> because one of the things I would do at, at, at real events, on the ground events, whatever we used to call it, whatever we used to do uh, back at when we would go to the cosmopolitan or whatever well i would i would go to these late night events i would force myself out the door because i knew there'd be some drunk customers and you know i need i need to contrast what they have to say with what i hear from the keynote stage otherwise there's a dissonance there that i i can feel it but i can't figure out the specifics and so i am a little bit challenged but i'll admit it by the virtual aspect in that way i do have to figure out like really creative ways of getting the kind of stuff that i used to be able to get from customers after they, after they had a couple of drinks at the bar. 
Well, let me push it. Let me push this along a bit. I think the other problem is you can't get real information about what's going on with a lot of great, let's say, implementations. That's really hard right now. You don't. A, uh, a lot of companies don't want to talk about them even more so than they did in the past because if they're doing anything, they're doing a small project, not a big one. And uh, they're doing everything remotely, and they're not 100% sure how well it's always going. Now, there have been a few. I don't know. You guys found some. You and Den both, I think, have found some uh, Oracle Cloud Fusion customers that have recently gone live. That's great. But I'm not finding the quantity and volume of uh, customers to talk to who are going through these larger projects. Uh, there are some other issues there. Maybe we can get into those about what's actually happening in the market. But uh, that's the other thing where, I, you know, I, I live to hear what is really going on on those larger, large scale kind of initiatives. And the words are pretty quiet right now. I want to get back to that, but it seems like the re the ring fencing discussion has a little bit of juice. Um, Leo says around ring fencing ERP, it happens all the time. One solution to that is protect the core ERP and innov innovate outside. Yep. Um, that uh, This approach is really not understood. Leo, do you want to maybe elaborate a little bit uh, around why it's not understood? But I think your Leo's perspective is interesting because he's working on pretty large scale SAP projects and... Uh, if, if he's seeing it, it kind of shows you how the market is shifting from core ERP. I think a lot of people think core is a commodity, is what it boils down to, that it's a transaction processor first and foremost. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that means we, um, uh, you know, it, it, look, if you took all your IT portfolio and you mapped it in a two by two matrix, and on one dimension, you've got tactical versus strategic. The other one, you're going to have package versus custom. You'll often find that there's a clump of ERP applications like fixed asset accounting that's pretty darn tactical and not very strategic. It's often something you're going to buy a package on. In fact, if you told me that your company's running with a custom fixed asset system, I wouldn't want to be your auditor because somebody's probably putting the words creative and accounting together in the same sentence. And that usually will get you a jail sentence when something like that's going on. So there's no reason to take risk on that. Same thing with payroll. And uh, a lot of ERP stuff over time shifts down into that one quadrant of tactical and package. And it, it you're not getting competitive advantage out of those things. You get competitive parity as maybe all you get. So once you've achieved competitive parity, why do you want to pour more money into it? You kind of isolate that and focus your IT people and your scarce business capital on the strategic custom things that are going to really drive the business forward. For example, uh, if you haven't gone online, um, e-commerce, whatever, omni-channel uh, commerce, that's something you definitely want to spend money on, but maybe not in back office accounting. Yeah, so, so, so Leo, um, you, you, I don't want to get too deep into the into the Sapanese on this on this show, but but um, SAP uh, meaning SAP Cloud Platform. The the thing I would just say to you, Leo, is that that's just even though adoption of SAP SAP Cloud Platform is is not stellar, and I think SAP realizes that. Um, that's not that doesn't mean that the ring fencing strategy isn't uh, in effect in a lot of SAP customers. It's just that that ring fencing can go a lot of different directions. And, um, you know, if, if SAP gets lucky, it's like really exceptional third party SAP solutions, but it can also be their competitors products in various areas uh, or all kinds of AI best of breed solutions or what have you. Um, ring fencing is really about this notion that, that, that customer facing stuff carries more precedence right now. And, and I use the word customer loosely to include things like supply chain, um, suppliers in the back end, I anything outside the four walls of the enterprise, basically. That would include a whole lot of value chain kind of oriented stuff. Uh, yep. Where, you know, it's where the money's at, really. And uh, it's where, you know, we, there are a lot of companies out there, they want to put a digital fingerprint 
on everything from where the uh, raw material is I don't know, coming out of the ground in some other part of the world and follow that all the way through till it's in the hands of an end consumer and maybe even beyond that as part of some kind of service or maintenance deal that carries on with the product thereafter. And they want that whole, uh, you know, digital fingerprint known, documented, and they want to create a whole new way of like doing cost accounting and so forth to understand how, you know, where, where the value is that they're creating in a firm. So I'd agree with you on that. Uh, the ring fencing is actually also a reaction to some, um, there's a value component and where's the, the real value and the strategic opportunity, but there's also some real hard and fast deals where if I'm a CIO, I'm being challenged every day to support even more things. I got to support all my employees, mobile phones or smartphones. I got to support all this new dial in access. I've got uh, all these new remote workers that I never had to deal with before. Uh, I've got uh, telephony for the buildings. I've got building security and it just goes on and on. I mean, the list of what a CIO has to maintain or is responsible for is just just a, a never ending list. And the question is where are they going to put their money and their attention? And if they can ring fence the ERP, that's a huge amount of headaches. They can kind of compartmentalize and leave alone and not have to spend the money on it. Yeah. Um, a little more um, uh, uh, Sapanese here that I want to get into because it's, it's relevant beyond SAP uh, LinkedIn user here. We have used SAP BW to join ERP data together some very good success stories from my experience that things that would be too expensive and convoluted to do an ERP. Uh, I, I, I want to mention that because you, you raise a very good point there in the sense that when, when we talk about ring fencing, what we're saying is that there's higher impact projects elsewhere and, and LinkedIn user is correct. Many of those projects are data related in some way. Um, you know, Planning has become a really, really big issue. I mean, one of the big buzzwords you hear this year is around continuous what have you. And, and it's a little bit of buzzword bingo, but the whole point is that is that uh, planning can no longer be an annual or even a quarterly process. You need to be able to plan and run different scenarios practically on a daily basis. What happens if the pandemic runs a year? What happens if it runs three years? What happens if customer demand spikes? What happens if I have to redo my supply chain because I can't go into China anymore or whatever it is? Mm -hmm. um, and and so, so those type of analytics projects have a lot of traction right now. I would simply say, however, that, that old school data warehousing solutions like SAP BW are probably not where most of the action is at right now, even for SAP customers. I would say that, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, Tableau type analytics or, 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 or other kinds of third party planning tools. SAP is under a lot of duress from third party uh, analytics providers. And not just SAP, I mean, many ERP providers are under that same pressure. And part of it is for the reason that, Brian, you already mentioned, which is to make these kinds of decisions, you can't just be drawing on data from one repository or one software system. Whatever data platform you, ha you have, it's got to be able to pull in all kinds of data, weather data, uh, so maybe social sentiment data, all kinds of stuff that ERP systems and, and even their data warehouses are not very good at dealing with. Yeah, that gets to the question of, is there such a thing as a book of record? And, you know, can one system really hold it all? Uh, I think there's a great market actually for some specialized tools that handle, um, uh, like some tools are brilliant handling massive amounts of daily kind of information or minute to minute, second to second stuff. I wouldn't want to put sensor data, for example, in its raw form into my uh, ERP. I'd want to do something with it well before, you know, let, let some other system sort through the data, look for the anomalous stuff, and then maybe start pushing it, uh, it through some kind of algorithmic or machine learning tool to find out what the recommended course of action should be based on what signals are coming up. One of the things that you mentioned, John, that I think bears more amplification is in all this rush for all this incredible new planning that people want to do and the frequency that's increased, the question also is, we need to change the way we plan where we've got more forward looking signals out there and we need to get data sets that are good at helping us understand when a signal change is occurring in the market. Uh, 
where this got a lot of discussion where people were trying to identify where there are hot spots popping up on like COVID infections. But there's a lot more that you could look at. How do we know like if the oil prices are going to collapse or not? What are the forward indicators? Do we have a database that we can tap into that? The pharma industry has been great for decades at buying and knowing about prescription data. They know what doctors are prescribing within about 24 to 48 hours of a script being written because somebody goes to get it filled. Anyway, they know what that is. They know they know the activity. They know roughly where it's happening. And they know about it weeks and months ahead of when it would actually show up in their originating or their um, uh, transaction ERP-based kind of systems in the back end. So I think there's a great market for all kinds of tools. And also to your listener I think we need to also realize that not every customer is going to be at the same point in their evolution. There are some companies that are, you know, that got hammered so bad in the uh, pandemic that they have gone from being functioning entities to almost dysfunctional. And they need, they need like to close the gaps on integration. They may need to port stuff over to the cloud or whatever. They've got their set of problems. And analytics and BI kind of tools are probably not high up on the list at the moment. There's another group that's functioning, but wants to become process excellent. They need more insights and they're going to want more advanced analytics, and more data. And then they're the ones that are process excellent who want to become transform, you know, the kind of firm that transforms the way competition works in an industry. And for that kind of company, they're going to look for the whole, you know, enchilada. They want all that cool technology, all the new data, uh, types and everything else. So we've got a continuum of business problems and we need a continuum of solutions to make it work. Yeah, absolutely. And and to the LinkedIn user as far as like uh as far as like Tableau, I mean obviously yeah, Tableau and BW is not a direct comparison. But but basically what I what I was basically just saying um is that SAP BW type projects are not the go-to type of analytics projects right now is all I'm saying. Um, but, but having said that, like it might be that it's perfect for some customers. So don't, don't think that I'm totally trashing it. Um, every company needs to figure out their own data strategy. And I'm not in the business of making product recommendations on the show. I'm simply saying that, that SAP has its work cut out for it. Creating um, user-friendly products in that particular space is all. Um, <laughs> So actually, I'd like to tie into your point and the last one I did. And I'm sorry if my paradigm shifted and all the other buzzwords I'm not supposed to use. Uh-oh. But uh, No, but um, I, I think there is a uh, I look I, I've been on the phone with some clients and pro- prospective clients. And one of the things they're struggling with is they don't have necessarily a plan and they're at all and their management is it but thinks their internal situation is very different from maybe what the rank and file, you know, frontline kind of people are seeing in their own organization. We have a, um, we really have a problem with a lot of companies. They need to stop and take a very fresh assessment of really where they're at so that they can actually do a good job of figuring out where they want to go and going forward. Uh, I kind of liken this to, and I've used this example before, if you, uh, growing up, if we ever saw us, all of us kids, we saw our parents like packing up clothes and getting ready to go on vacation. We didn't necessarily know where we were going, and we couldn't even help them with that uh, that packing because if you don't know where you're going, you don't know what to bring with you on vacation. And I would say the same thing is true with a lot of these systems projects right now is I don't think there's a lot of unanimity in companies today about where you're at, let alone where you want to go. And I don't know that they have the right projects, let alone the right technologies lined up that they want to put in place. So um, and that oftentimes sometimes is going to require And this one client I'm thinking of in particular, when they start bringing all this new data together, it's going to challenge the way they do cost accounting as mundane as that sounds. They don't have a standard way of capturing cost or reporting cost in their own firm. And how are you going to get to build consensus uh, when everyone's like locked down and not able to travel? You can't get people together in a room uh, unless it's virtual to kind of hammer some of this out. And those are some of the challenges I think with some of the bigger transformation deals going down today. Absolutely. All right. I want to shift gears just a little bit because I want to get in just a few minutes. I want to get into our advice for for customers on our discussion today. But before we do that, I, I guess I just want to talk a little bit, Brian, about 
our, our, our respective roles in the market and how we come about our ideas. Because, you know, the, the thing is that in, in our industry, most people in so-called analysts are associated with bigger firms to do quantified research and then they digest that. Um, folks like you and I, I mean, I'm with a smaller media group to Genomica, but we have kind of an analyst sensibility. You're one of the stalwart independent analysts we have left in this industry. We don't have the advantage of conducting a ton of quantitative research, but we we come about our insights in a different way. <laughs> and, you know, I think the one thing you and I have in common around that is we end up becoming, the things we learn make us pretty grouchy, I think, around the buzzwords that are that are thrown around. And, and I can explain like why I have an issue with a lot of the AI hype, for example, and, and even more so the blockchain hype. And, you know, I get pinged by PR folks all day long about next gen this and next gen that. I want to go on a rant about hyper personalization a little bit. Um, but, <laughs> but the thing that is for me is I'm looking at customer proof points and, you know, Diginomica at the core of it, what we're looking at is, is, is customer realities and what it takes to, to run successful projects and, and have good outcomes, which are actually still very rare in this, in this industry, uh, unfortunately. And, you know, while we do believe in transformation and that is the focus, it's not really transformation as vendors define it. It's, you know, technology, yes, plays a role and certainly the pandemic technology has played a very important role in, in some areas. But, you know, in, in my view, it's really transformations about people, process, technology. It's, it's all those things at the, you know, it, it's, you can't isolate one thing. It, it, it's culture, it's everything. It's, and, 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 and fundamentally it's business model change, right? If you can't adapt and, and change your business model and make better decisions and all that stuff, empower users, make your customers happy, then, then what is it? So, so that's my, how I go about things. And I have my own ways of getting that information. Most of it is just, you know, very creative uses of my network and, and scouring. And then I have, you know, research and curation through my newsfeed and my weekly column and stuff. So, so, so that's kind of my view on it. How do you go about it? I know I have a very different way of approaching things and uh, what your listeners may not and know about me is I've been doing this for about 30 years and um, I've led some monster projects all over the planet and I live for those kind of big complex hairy things uh, but part of my job has always been either brokering things between either customers and vendors or sometimes between vendors and when I was with Accenture with the firm and I look for the tells. I've seen, it's kind of like uh, if I'm a, um, if I were like a movie critic on like uh, the, the movie channel, I would, uh, I could tell you like, I already kind of know a lot based if I know who the director is or the screenwriter or whatever, who the actors are. I kind of know roughly before it even starts what's going to happen. Uh, with these vendors, a lot of them have some very basic tells. You and I have seen some of the very same executives bounce around from one vendor to the next to the next uh, over the years and you kind of know what their playbook is going to be. I know I, I I look forward to a briefing where somebody surprises me in a pleasant way with something I wasn't expecting. I, I love those. I don't get enough of them and I, uh, I, I also stand shoulder to shoulder with my clients. I'm a buy side guy and when they're frustrated in demos it it upsets me because I've tried to do my best to streamline this process and coach the vendor. And yet somebody tuned it all out and went back to their usual shtick. I go over their contracts with them. I help and assist in a lot of contracts. And that's where I see the economics of things really come about. I stand in my client's shoes and I'm like knee deep in this stuff all the time. And that's where I get a perspective that I think a lot of analysts don't have or don't keep fresh. And that's what kind of hurts them. Uh oh. Well, and I know to the LinkedIn person uh, who just wrote that about Accenture, uh, I left that firm in 1999. So whatever they've done to you since then, I have no, um, I have no accountability on. So anyway. <laughs> well, and, and, and it is true that a lot of the screwed up projects in our world come down to, 
uh, ridiculously overpriced and unwieldy consultancies. And Accenture is not the only one that has fallen into that category on many occasions. Accenture's also done some really good stuff around uh, around their digital practices. But the the point is like so many of these firms ride on reputation and not on the quality of their delivery. And 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 when you talk about classic ERP, you're talking about expense ratios for consulting that are like one to ten or one to twelve. And that's unacceptable in today's environment. And so I, I understand a little bit of the consulting hostility there, but you know, every firm has good and bad consultants as well. So well, I will tell you this, from the uh, having been on the inside of Accenture for so long, 10 years of it actually was at headquarters, I was always amazed at one thing, and that was their ability to see around the corner and make a major shift in their business at the perfect time. They're, they are outstanding in that regard. And I don't know if many of you caught it, but just a, uh, recently they've announced a $3 billion investment they're going to put into building out their cloud practice. In effect, I think what they're sh saying is they're, the market has moved, it's shifted, and they're going to move with it. They always want to be just a little bit ahead. That way they can charge uh, premium billing rates. They don't want to be in commodity markets. They really don't. And I think you've got to ask yourself, uh, if you're listening, where's my career going and which skills do I really want to be identified with longer term that are going to be paying the bills, keep the lights on, everything else? Um, if you, you know, I'm probably not going to become a algorithm writer, but uh, if my kids were asking where they should go with their career, if it involves technology, I'd be pushing them hard on some of the advanced technologies, but also on the social sciences. I heard uh, Tom Peters talk this week, and he made a, a, a point that really stuck with me, which was... Um, uh, he thinks a lot of MBA programs need to do a hard stop and uh, rethink their uh, course curriculum because he thinks a lot of the stuff was oriented around a world, a business world that was uh, heavily skewed towards manufacturing and supply chain from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever. But now with so many people in softer industries, whether uh, service companies or something as a service or it's a consultancy or what have you, that there's very little in MBA programs that talks about the management of people or the management of projects. And on that point, at the HR conference this week, one of the speakers pointed out that only one in 24 executives or managers actually knows how to run a project. And I thought that was just like, wow. So if we're moving to this people-based kind of world, I think we need to get everything straightened out on it. But I think that um, the smart thing to look at is why are consulting firms like Accenture making this shift? And what does it mean to me? And mm. let's personalize that and think about that a bit. Absolutely. Um, so uh, folks who are joining the, the show, I think you're probably getting a little sense of the vibe that I want to have for the show, which is that – it's kind of a little bit of a talk radio format. Uh, you're limited to text comments, but uh, but you know we'll flow with what you have to say here a bit, and uh, we're not in any rush to wrap up. But we we're not going to go on forever either. So um, as as we move into a little bit around uh, the customer advice we want to give, I also would encourage the the individuals in the chat. If any of you want to put out anything pertaining to your own career. Uh, you know, feel free to feel free to do so if you have any questions about that, because we're going to our advice is going to be more for like enterprise level uh, customers, not so much individuals. But if you have any questions, po put that out there. So, um, so, so, Brian, just just to finish up the last piece of that. So how are you kind of staying on top of 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 your the way you gather information on the market and, and get your sort of sharp grouchy takes that you're legendary for. Cause I've seen you make vendors uncomfortable on so many occasions, but, but you did that by flying, you know, in the middle seat of a lot of crappy, you know, seat, you know, the C group and a lot of Southwest flights when you got bumped from the A group. And so, so how do you do it now? Oh, uh, I've been doing it with a lot of phone calls and, uh, but I'll tell you what, there is a, I don't know about you, John, but I kind of feel like the universe of people that you can call and tap into, I, if I, I want to, I would say it feels like it collapsed a bit. I, uh, the accidental meetings, whatever, just aren't as common anymore. And 
you're right. I actually sat next to some fascinating people on planes and got got books worth of uh, great intel out of them. I really loved uh, walking the halls at uh, clients' uh, operations, and you know, you get man, you get this like it's like a. I, f- I feel sometimes after some of these big projects, like I earned another master's degree or doctorate, you know, in um, people issues more than anything else. Uh, the ability to stare at somebody and look at them and figure out, is this going to be the person that's going to be the obstinate, um, you know, toss a gear in the wrench, and you know, kind of person that's going to be my change management terror on this project or not? I can do that in person. It's a lot harder to do it on Zoom. And getting the right intel about the vendors, um, you know, again, I would tell you that I know the usual traps and stuff, and and I know how to set them, and I can catch them a lot of times in a lie. And um, a couple of our peers one time accused me of prosecuting the uh, like third largest vendor once when I knew their cloud stats weren't correct, and I nailed them on it. How I do it today is getting to become ever more frustrating. I, I would be lying if I told you I had this slam dunk deal that made it super easy, but it's getting harder and harder. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing about pandemic life. And, I, you know, I, I raised hell on someone else's LinkedIn show the other day about this because I felt they were romanticizing disruption. And one of my big things around disruption in the pandemic is certainly real disruption, not fake disruption, but real is that disruption wipes away business models, but it doesn't automatically replace them with something new and better. And I think in the pandemic, we're all being stretched in various ways and it and it doesn't necessarily make things better. We have to figure out how to cope. And p- part of it is just getting through it. And part of it is getting really creative. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't think we have all the answers. Um, but w- one thing I do know is that, is that, you know, you grind, like you, you try to get better every day and, and yeah. that's what I do, and and I and I'm sure you do it too. Um, I'm, do, I'm doing a lot of what I would call collecting of secondhand information. I call and talk to other like integrators and implementers, and I'm talking to them. I'm, I also talk a lot with like hedge fund people and Wall Street analysts. Uh, I would say it's made me push the envelope and push more on some of those alternate sources information. Is it my preferred source? No, not always, but actually it's been good because it made me reassert and and reinvigorate some of those relationships. But it's different. It's changed. That's the bottom line. Uh, Just a real quick one here. This is a really specific question around opportunities and potential clinical trial systems. There must be must be so much out there. I mean, my my first response is, I don't know. I'm not an expert in clinical trial uh, IT and technology hiring. But one one thing I always did because I was a recruiter long ago. And one thing I always advise people to do is is have a look at some of the job orders and see how they stack up against your experience and uh, and kind of start to figure out like where the gaps are and and figure out how to how to close them if you need to. Um, sometimes it takes a little time to do that. Well, I'll actually be thinking about this. I'm on a panel next week on, with somebody from Eli Lilly and one other drug company. So I'm sure I'll have a chance to uh, pop in on that. But anyway, all right. So I saw something flash up there. It said, what, evolution is IT? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mahesh, you may need to elaborate on that a little bit. I, it didn't stay on the screen too long because it wasn't too self-explanatory. But, uh, <laughs> but, hey, but and, and, and I'll tell you what, don't worry about that, guys. I send things sometimes to Diginomica and they kick it back saying it wasn't exp- yeah. self-explanatory enough. But anyway, go. We, we do, we do push, push copy back sometimes, even from – from the brilliant mind of someone like Brian Summer, but, uh, but no, he, he always comes through in the end with, with good reading material. If you haven't read Brian's stuff on Diginomic, I, I highly rec- recommend you, um, you check it up. Oh, uh, we have one here um, around the UK government. Um, we're, we're actually, um, for those that haven't read my weekly hits and misses column on Diginomica, I have a whiff section. <laughs> I, I, I got into this a little bit, but Dennis Haller wrote a whole article on this. Um, but this is a classic whiff at the end of this radio show in a little bit, we're going to do our little whiffs. Um, but this one certainly, uh, absolutely qualifies. That was a massive, uh, screw up. And I think pretty much, um, kind of, kind of a typical, um, illustration of how, 
I think, far removed our governments are from the digital literacy that they that they need right now, and that and that we sorely need. Um, not not just to to be economically successful, but simply to stay safe. You'll love this, John. I was helping out a major consultancy, oh, probably 10 or 11 years ago, and I'm talking then about big data. Um, some guy in the audience asked, uh, you know, so what's your definition of big data? How big is it? And before I could say anything, somebody else very seriously, a senior manager or partner in that firm goes, it's big data when it won't fit in an Excel spreadsheet. And I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe that was what the state of the thinking was at that point in time. So, yeah, they made a mistake on that one for sure. Whoa. Well, if, if you like Brian's stuff, uh, start on Diginomica. He also has his own thing going. So you'll find him on social channels as well, sharing his latest insights. Brian S. Summer on Twitter, as you can see. So give him a follow. Thank, uh, thanks for whoever wrote that. And, and I'm sure... I'm sure I'll find out later on it was one of my kids, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> hey, man, if your kids find you interesting, that's not too shabby either, man. Well, that's not, not every parent can say that. Uh, the holiday season's coming up. Somebody's fishing for a gift, maybe. Anyway, we got, uh, you know, may always trying to figure out what's the angle here. All right. Anyway, so. All right. So, so Brian, let's do kind of a lightning round of like, like, like what, sh what do you think enterprise customers, CIO types should, should take from what we discussed today or, or just a few tips in general? One of them that we did mention was you, if there ever was a time to really sit down, get some quality time and do a real current IT strategic plan, it's now. So much stuff has changed. Whatever you thought the world was going to be all about in 2019 is gone. You've probably got some of the firefighting stuff out of the way you need to be thinking about where you're going to go next. And I would suggest it's not a, going to be a linear extension of kind of the initiatives and projects you had going on from like 2018, 2019, and you would have done this year. No, I think it's going to be a complete different list. And it's time to come up with what that plan is all about. I also think it's time for CIOs to get out and play in traffic and really do some serious looking around outside of their industry to find out what the what is the art of the possible today. Uh, I'm not going to give a plug here directly, but you know, John and a few other people I know love to write about really innovative kind of case studies at companies. You need to find out what other people are doing and find out what technologies they're looking at. And we use that to maybe have some brown bag lunches or whatever webinars with your own staff so everyone kind of gains from this new knowledge that you're going to collect. Um, you know, if you can't see it and in, uh, or touch it or whatever right now, or you, you're not going to be able to imagine all this stuff on your own. And again, there's always a wealth of new things popping up. You can't be all things to all people and know all this stuff without doing some homework. So do that first. John. Yeah, I think you pretty much got it there. I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of add a, a few quick things, which is I think that um, that having the when, you, when we talked about consulting firms earlier, I think a lot of times the big firms are overrated and um, and having partners that understand your industry is so important right now. Um, there's not so many one size fits all situations anymore. Um, so I really think aligning with the right people who understand your industry and can help you understand how you're effective and how you're not versus your peers is, is a really big deal right now. Because if you're a hotel, you can't be comparing yourself with 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 companies that have a higher degree of demand than you. You have to figure out how to compete on the terms you're dealing with. Um, along those lines, I would I would also say, you know, fund from within is a big thing, right? So cost control via things like process and workflow automation. Um, and then figuring out like that, that it doesn't stop there. I mean, one thing that bothers me a lot is, is when we assume that that's really enough. I mean, really it's a cliche, but the CIO should be, should be supporting business model transformation. And so, you might not come up with those business models, but you better be able to support it. And that means being able to eradicate the things that are in the way when you're, when your line of business people say, wouldn't it be nice if we could do that? You need to be able to deliver that not six months from now or a year from now, but quick. And, and whatever that's going to take, you're going to have to figure out whether that's a data platform or, or a different user experience strategy or application development resources or whatever it is going to have to be. Um, you're going to have to do that. And Oh, by the way, security, 
and cybersecurity and all that crap, that's just another thing you have to deal with. It, it just comes with the territory. Can I pile on one more point related to that? Yeah, John? yeah. Uh, and that would be, the you know, it bothers me when I run into management of companies who uh, want to continue to use a supplier uh, just because we've used them in the last, you know, like 50 years, 90 years, whatever. And when it comes to technology, uh, sometimes whether it's the hardware or it's the application software or it's the consulting firm, I'm going to put this right out right now. The firm that got you all the way through to where you are today may not be the firm that can take you forward into the new brave world because the new world will require different skills, different competencies, different knowledge. And you may be making a big change. I didn't use the word pivot, but you make a big change that's going to move you into a whole new direction or business model. And you've got to be prepared, in the words of Dear Abby, to seek true love elsewhere if that's what it takes to find a different kind of partner or different partners, whatever, to make this happen for you. Yeah, and the final piece of that is 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 project accountability. And um, the the thing I would put out there, you know, uh, we have I'm available to hire if needed, independent quality, no bullshit. Um, it helps if we have a name, but that's okay. Maybe the name appears on LinkedIn because I'm not looking on LinkedIn. So, uh, but anyway, LinkedIn users available for hire, <laughs> but, 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 but kidding aside I, around the hiring part. I'll um, team with them. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, good to know. Yeah. Ping, ping Brian later. Um, but, but anyway, the, the thing I do want to say is, is, and, and, and to your point around, okay, some of these companies have seven year contracts that that could well be the case. But, but despite that fact, uh, the thing is, even in pandemic times, you need to you need to be building a smart network of people that you can turn to. That includes people like like Brian. That includes people like the people in this chat. That includes your peers, and and you need to be able to get gut checks and come up for air uh, when you initiate once you embark upon these projects. Because yeah, you might have a a long term commitment with a, with a service provider that you can't get out of, but that doesn't mean you can't bring in an independent to to audit that project or at least seek out independent advice on social channels and get a gut check. The, the whole thing about it is that just because you have a consulting partner doesn't mean you have to hand over control of your project to that partner. It's all about owning the project, and that requires you to be more informed and more in control and give less faith and trust to external providers. Brian, the, did, I get, did I nail that one? Are we good? Yeah, I, okay. you know, it's not like I'm right. speechless. It's just I don't know that I want to add anything else onto that. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. No, no, that that's good. I mean, we've gone on for for long enough. Okay, so uh, what do we have left? I think we just have our our weekly. Did uh, did we cover everything? I think we might get to the whiffs now, since we got the advice and lessons. Yeah. So let's let's. Did you did you notice any uh, any whiffs this week, Brian? That stood out for you. Uh, I was a guest speaker on one of these great web conference user things like you're talking about. And when you were talking about how you had the ability after you talk to go join up with other people, it didn't work for me before or after the talk. So I was part of a conference that I could not connect to anybody on. And to me, I was I was really kind of frustrated about it and almost perturbed because um I can't, uh, you know, part of the reason for doing this is to connect with other people, and and that was missing. That to me was a big whiff, but I know that's not what you want, the kind that you love to snark all over, you know, in your article and um, uh, your weekly deal. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, go, I'll, go, I'll go over a few while you're thinking about them. Uh, I, I had a microphone with the other day. I call with, it's called the self whiff. My, the mic that you're watching completely fell off. You had an unbelievable green screen adventure this uh, this fall, but I won't get into that one. Um, uh, it's available on replay uh, somewhere if, if 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 someone's really resourceful. But but uh, a couple of the funny ones I put in in hits and misses. I I did not touch on the the Zoom attire malfunction because that oh yeah that that was too that was just too ridiculous. Um, but the one thing I did say about that in my column was uh, for Diginomic was uh, that I don't know that I didn't know the cam was on. I think that kind of falls short sometimes. Um, and then um, my article title of the week was Escaped Cloned 
female mutant crayfish takes over Belgian cemetery. I thought that was pretty special. Um, and then I also loved um, this guy. I, I have these uh, frequent things in my R Connected Future file. Uh, I have a guy, Rashik, on Twitter who uh, reverse engineered McDonald's Eternal API. Yeah, and, I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> currently placing an order worth $18,000 every minute at every McDonald's in the U.S. <laughs> to figure out which ones have a broken ice cream machine. So I thought that was pretty uh, pretty classic. But um, And, and finally... Uh, I just want to go on a little bit. Um, uh, uh, oh, thank you, by the way, LinkedIn user. We had a good time uh, with your questions as well. You had some excellent comments. Yep. Uh, I also wanted to, to finally say um, I, I I get some great stuff from PR people, and I feel bad for them sometimes because if they catch me when I'm, when I'm on like a caffeine rush or I haven't eaten in a while uh, and they send me the wrong buzzword, sometimes I'll send them something back. <laughs> and uh, I got – I got one about loyalty programs and uh, you know um, people basically pushing like what's wrong with reward programs and silly mistakes, loyalty programs. And it wants to talk about how AI and ML can help brands solve these challenges. Get ready for this, Brian, by automating hyper personalized offers. And I'll bet you would like to hear what I wrote back. Uh, sure. I want to hear this, but go ahead. <laughs> Um, I said, uh, I basically started out by saying some loyalty programs are better than others, but none of them have succeeded in the type of hyper personalization you were describing here. <laughs> um, uh, one reason I think, uh, so, so I said, I put technology aside for a moment. I said, one reason I think is because of a very cynical approach to email marketing. Take hotels as an example. Even if they have the right data, they think, I don't care if John has never stayed here recreationally and only for business. Send him the recreational offer anyhow, because 10% of the people like him, just like him, are going to bite on it. I don't care if it bothers John or not. So what I said was until businesses are willing to change that, hyper-personalization doesn't matter, even if you can do it. I, I basically said the technology isn't ready from what I've seen, but even if it's ready, it's too easy to spray and pray and hope for the best. So that's my issue there. So I'll, uh, I don't know, we're not, I'm not going to try one up, but I'll add one to the pile. I got, a, right. I got a pitch from the vendor AR group, the analyst relations group from one of the majors, one of the big boys. I got it this week and they got my name right at the top, uh, you know, the form filler deal to it. This was a announcement about a new product release, but buried down in the body of it, they didn't put in the name of the product. They had a blank line with parents around it and an asterisk where the name of the new product is supposed to go. Oh, nice. <laughs> Wait, you'll, so I write back to the AR lady and go, you know, I can't wait to get a story out about parents, underline, asterisk, closed parent. This sounds like a fantastic new product that everyone will want to know about. <laughs> I go, so, can you send me a screenshot of parent asterisk underline close parent? You know, and I had to do this whole thing about this big long email oh, about what a phenomenal thing this is going to be. Anyway, I get this reply back like, "Okay, Brian, you made your point. We we should read our own copy a little bit better." <laughs> so you oh, don't have man. it. Doesn't even have to be heavily automated to be screwed up. And anyway, everyone can get a whiff. And uh, what everyone on this call should do is make sure you live your life with the kind of attention to detail that you never end up on John's whiff column. <laughs> if I read anything of his piece every week on hits and misses, I go right to the whiffs first to make sure I'm not in it, you know, because I could inadvertently have done something on Diginomica that'll get me in there and I'd live in mortal fear that might happen. Anyway. The one thing I haven't figured out how to do on the broadcast is strike throughs unless I oh. <laughs> unless I did my own like comment, which I could maybe do a strike through in the comment. I'll have to check that sometime. But uh, that's the only thing I can't duplicate. But 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 um but I appreciate um everyone who joined and and if you missed any of it, it will be put out on replay. You'll be able to see the video replay. It'll also go out on, to my audio subscribers. Uh, I have an audio version of this called Busting the Omni Channel, which you can do a search on. Um, but, but you know, the reason I call this 
Enterprise Hits and Misses Radio is because I'm really just a frustrated um, talk show DJ that never got an opportunity to do that. Um, so, uh, but but I think the whole radio thing is basically like just the hell with over polished video. Like let's let's have some real conversations. And Brian's a great sport for doing it. Just on my second time, I don't think we had any technical difficulties, which is kind of amazing. Oh wait, we got Stephanie here. Stephanie from uh, Sage Intact. Hey Stephanie, how we doing? Hey Stephanie, um, you, you missed our um, section on how much Brian hates ERP vendors. Sorry you missed that. I think you would have <laughs> enjoyed that one. I don't. Um, I know we can't get audio on her, but um, uh, don't don't mess it up, John. I you know I have a good relationship with Sage so far uh, on the intern yeah. side. So let's. Uh, I'd like to keep that one going because what your audience may not know is. Every year, there's at least one vendor that doesn't want to deal with me because, uh, I don't know, maybe I called them on something a little too hard. But anyway, all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stephanie, I appreciate you uh, you swinging by. Uh, I hope I hope uh, you enjoyed all the Sage Intact Advantage coverage. I, I lost some sleep on the last one I did. Um, Brian wrote a monster piece. Uh, if, if you guys don't follow Sage Intact, very interesting vendor to check out. Uh, Part of the reason for that is because I think what they're trying to do with expanding both horizontally and vertically at the same time is, is very interesting. Um, and, and also just the data and, and analytics strategies and issues they're trying to conquer. So uh, I just wrote a piece on, on that today. So and, and one of the things was about like uh, how all cloud ERP vendors are pushing to be perceived um, as strategic and analytical systems, not just operational and transactional but then, then what, what does the buyer do? What does the customer do as far as do you look at the vendor's offerings? Do you look at third-party stuff? It's very interesting stuff, and uh, Sage and Tax right in the middle of that. So uh, it's nice to, see, nice to see Stephanie Stephanie here catching the end, tail end of this. And, yeah, you can, uh, you can see Brian go off on ERP in the beginning, Stephanie, so I'm sure you'll enjoy that. Uh, they actually have a phenomenal CTO, uh, Aaron Harris, and um... – uh, I had the pleasure, and he may not agree with this, but Aaron and I were on a flight to go to Dallas out of Hellsburg, California, this time last year. And I don't know, the plane got screwed up or the, there was some terrible delay. And anyway, I ended up bending his ear for about three hours at the airport in the gate area. But I got a great, I have a great respect for the guy because he really knows his stuff. And I think if we'd have been there another three hours, we, the two of us probably would have pulled out some paper and re-architected some of the um, other Sage applications while we're at it. Anyway, he's a good guy. Uh, Stephanie, uh, for future notice, we're gonna I'm gonna try to do this every week at four four p.m. Eastern time on Friday, and I may have bonus uh, uh, sections as well. Uh, Brian will definitely be a frequent guest. We I still need to talk with Brian about whether he actually enjoyed doing this today and whether he wants to come back. But my, my vision is that Brian Brian will be coming back on a on a regular basis to sh because his his pearls of enterprise insider have not been exhausted, um, despite the fact we've been. <laughs> We've been going on for for an hour now. Unfortunately, uh, we we still left a lot on the table, Brian. I'm sorry about that, man. Uh, yeah. Well, you haven't seen me at a client. I mean, I can go all morning long, and then even in the afternoon, just let's talk about who's on your short list, and we'll go through all that. Uh, yeah, I got I got a I got a ton of material. Uh, anyway, and I, I will say I will say for those who have never seen, like the the thing about the thing about our world, Brian, is that like a lot of people get to read our stuff. And, and, you know, I, I love hearing, having dialogue with readers, but a lot of people never get to see some of the closed events that we do, uh, with, with, with vendors. And, and I'll just, I'll just, uh, share with you guys, um, a classic Brian anecdote where Brian, he can be pretty talkative at, at events and raise his hand and get, get aggressive, like at our analyst events and stuff. But, but sometimes it's different. Sometimes it's like a tea kettle, and it starts like cold, but it starts to kind of boil over as, as like everything he's hearing is just rubbing him the wrong way. And, and I was, um, I, I was like watching this happen at this one vendor event. Finally, Brian blew a gasket. He stands up, he gets up, goes to the front and commandeers the whiteboard from the vendor, <laughs> starts writing. And, and this and is just absolutely fabulous, man. The other analysts in the room are just like, Oh my God, this guy is out of his freaking mind. 
it, it was it was a thing of beauty. Yeah, that wasn't an insignificant vendor either. Um, uh, <laughs> no, it was not. Well, yeah. let's just say, in fact, we probably should have talked about uh, that vendor today, but we ran out of time to get into that. So uh, maybe Brian will, will, will pick up on that next time. I'll make a note to get back to that topic because I don't think that topic is going to die down anytime soon. Um, for the LinkedIn user around getting caught off guard, thinking about what to ask, uh, don't worry about that, man. You, you asked some really good questions today. Um, so, uh, so thanks for keeping it real in the chat yeah. and, uh, and, and dissing Brian's, uh, former employer was entertaining. <laughs> so, uh, Stephanie, yeah, we wish, we wish you were here too, man. I remember, uh, having that great banter with you. Where were we at Brian's favorite hotel in Nashville? Oh, the, uh, uh, uh that glass biodome <laughs> thing. The, uh, you love that hotel. It's your oh, favorite, no, right? I can't stand that? <laughs> what is that called, Stephanie? The hotel that Brian loves so much? That was so fun. It's like this whole indoor, like it's it's almost like a... The Gaylord. Yeah, it was the Gaylord. That's right. It was the Gaylord, man. Your favorite spot. So for the listeners, in all fairness, uh, the problem with our job is all the vendors go to the same venues all the time everywhere. Okay. And so uh, we clearly have some things to moan and groan about sometimes when they pick some horrible location. Now, I'm not saying the Gaylord was horrible, but it, it, it has its challenges. Uh, but anyway, the, um, are, are you part of the Gaylord's uh, loyalty and rewards program, Brian? Because I hear there's a hyper personalized offer coming your way. <laughs> And I think they're part of Marriott now, but um, uh, it, this stuff gets so routinized that like John and I, a lot of times we'll hit some city. And the first thing we do, one of us will do is look up on um, Yelp or Google, whatever. We want to find like the best barbecue joint in that town. And we've hit a bunch of them over the years. And uh, I'll tell one on John. We, uh, we went to one in, uh, it was supposed to be highly rated in Atlanta. And oh yeah, that and one. And it turned out that the um, this piece of brisket I got, I, I tweeted about how you could have repaired tire tread with that piece of meat. I mean, it was it was tough, and yeah. and to my utter amazement and pleasure, the uh, CEO of the vendor that had us out there read that. You know, on his own, he sent some Kansas City barbecue uh, to the two of us, and. We didn't ask for it. We weren't, and I didn't tweet it because I was looking for something. I just thought, you know, as a guy from Texas, you really appreciate a good piece of barbecue, and that one was not it. Uh, that one was really tough. And then, in contrast, I think the folks at uh, another vendor must have been hip to that and arranged a barbecue crawl for us. And was that January of this year or like December of last year, something like that? And that was phenomenal. I thought. What'd you think? Oh yeah, that was classic. That was good. All right. Well, hey, hey, um, just real quick on the BW thing. Uh I, I don't have an issue with BW, like I said before. <laughs> it's all customer choice, man. If if it's a good fit for your customer, absolutely. Um, I'm only saying that 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 large scale data warehousing projects are not often the top choice for customers who are looking for quick results on analytics right now. That's all I'm saying. That I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. Um, just saying, it's just my observation. And, uh, and and I'm just simply saying that SAP has some work to do there. Um, but they know it, I've talked with them about it. They're trying to fix a lot of their analytics strategy right now. That's why the SAP Analytics Cloud product exists. And, uh, and you know, that's not an insult to BW at all. I'm glad you're getting results out of BW for, for in the field because, uh, you know, like I said, a lot of products haven't been successful in the past in BI. So if you're getting results, then that's all that matters, man. So don't don't take that personal. It's all good. And and yeah, if you want to message me and tell me a little more about uh, what you're accomplishing there, feel free. I'd love to hear more. Yeah, definitely message John. So not me. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, um, that is a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, probably a little bit too random, um, but it, it does, it does fit in with kind of the the theme of social etiquette in the, uh, in the, in the Zoom world. Um, 
And and fortunately, Brian and I went up, Brian and I went over that before the show, so there's not going to be any issues. In fact, we're going to sign off. But uh, but thanks for joining and for keeping the chat really active. That was fun. Uh, have a great night, everyone, and and we'll catch you soon. Take care. Thanks, everyone.